Hi, I'm Heidi Overhill, and this is a presentation for the paper titled Phantom Volume, a Spatial Explanation for Domestic Clutter. Uh, and what this paper is, is a, an exploration of what it means for a product to have a shape. So we're going to talk about positive form and negative space and introduce the idea that there's a third type of space called phantom volume, which is created when products move. Here's a, a drawing of a product. Uh, design is often called form giving because uh, large parts of it consist of giving form, these are product design, of giving form to physical materials. And here's a form created by noted 19th century English designer Christopher Dresser for a teapot. And you can see that what he's done is he's specified essentially a lump of material, it's very specific material, so it has its own characteristics. And there it is. So this is also uh, a physical form. And as soon as you say something is a physical form, that means that around it, it has negative space. In graphic design, you'll talk about uh, white space. In 3D design, it's empty space. So the thing about uh, negative space is that it's created automatically around the form. They, they're interdependent. If you change one, you change the other. You can't have one without the other. They, they exist. So when you're teaching design, you'll often tell students to pay attention to the negative space and make sure that it's as well organized as the positive forms. Here's a quote from uh, Rowena Reed Costello, who was a design teacher who taught at Pratt Institute. And uh, in it, she's urging uh, students to pay attention to what she calls negative volumes or concavities to make sure that these have a beautiful shape that is just as nice as the positive lumps of form that they are also creating. Um, so in that sense, uh, when we look at uh, the teapot, you can see that that's a negative shape inside the handle has a character of its own that you want to pay attention to. But negative space is also functional. Here is a quote from legendary philosophy Lao Tzu. Uh, this was uh, quoted by Victor Papenick in his book, Design for the Real World. And he's pointing out that a wheel, for example, is a solid thing. It's a lump of material, but it's the hole in the middle that makes it useful. And similarly for the clay cup, again, the cup is the cup, but it's the shape defined by the clay that is what you're using when you, when you drink from the cup. That's what holds the liquid. So um, looking at uh, Dresser's teapot, we can see that here are the important negative volumes. There's the space where you can put your hand in to hold the handle. And there's also the space that holds the tea and the spout, which goes up a little higher than that. So the teapot doesn't dribble on the table when you set it down. So here's a beauty shot of a kind of really super banal uh, kitchen appliance. It's a coffee maker and you can see it's got negative spaces and positive form. There's the handle, the space where you can grab it inside the crafts where the coffee goes and the, and the stand itself has negative space where you can slide the uh, coffee maker in. So the, the white background allows you to just look at those forms and concentrate on them. When you put it into a context, um, here you can see it's also exploiting negative space because it's sized so it can slide underneath the overhead cabinets. It's a bit more realistic, but actually not that realistic because as soon as you start to try to use that machine, this is its real shape. This is the phantom volume that it implies. And this is a neologism, and I define it as the space that's occupied by the moving parts of a product. You can see the space is quite precise. Um, the product is hard, the hinges are physical, and so these regular geometric shapes move in space in a highly determined way. And this is the shape that results. And if you block any part of that shape, the thing can't be used. You have to slide it out from underneath the cabinets so that there's room to flip open that upper lid, which you need to do to get out the filter and change the grounds and put in the water. And um, any blockage to any of that is going to stop from being useful. And in fact, it's quite likely to get blocked because it's sitting beside the sink, which is a busy place. And you might, for example, put some dirty coffee mugs there. So when you come to move the machine, you discover you have to push those aside and think badly about your housekeeping, what a slob you are, before you can slide it out. So it's customary to blame yourself for the house being messy. But I think in this case, it's an argument to be made 
that is the coffee machine that has in fact uh, told you that you are messy because if it didn't have to slide out, those mugs would not be mess. So there's other aspects we can go on. Here is taking the filter out and dumping the grounds in the composter. And here's getting the coffee out of the coffee can and putting it into the filter. Uh, you might think it'd be more convenient to put the coffee can closer, like maybe in the cabinet above the coffee maker. But if you do that, the lid locks the cabinet door. So you have to flip it back and forth. So that's actually really annoying. And we don't do that. And here's getting a clean mug out of the cupboard to measure the water to put into the machine, which is how we do it. And when you put those together, this is what you get. This is actually the real shape of that product when it's in use in the kitchen. So um, the, the little arms are not quite predictable. They can vary. You could move the can somewhere else. You might not measure the water this way. But by and large, this large shape is what is actually being introduced into your home when you put that machine into place. So uh, also, of course, you need space for the body of the user. If this is blocked in any way, you can't use the machine. So if there's grocery bags on the floor, they have to be moved before you can make coffee. Um, the, um, the body shape is much more malleable than the rigid form of the machine's phantom volume because there's, there's more of a sense of probability than anything because people's arms fly out, they sway, and also if needs be, you can push that person. They're, they're malleable. You can even squish the person. You need to get to the sink. But there it is. And you, it's, it's rapidly changing. You know, the user moves back and forth doing these various chores. And so in the end, this is actually a far more realistic picture of this is the shape of that product in your kitchen when it's in use. It's huge. So, uh, and here's putting milk in your coffee if you do that sort of thing. And it's also big and rapidly changing. And, and what you get is a situation where you say to each other things like, you're in my way, conflict in the kitchen. Here's another type of phantom volume. Um, this is the phantom volume of the cone of vision. In most cases, you have to be able to see something to use it. We're assuming someone with uh, good, good vision here. Um, if you can't see it, it's really not available for use. And um, it, the cone of vision, like the, the geometric movements of the machine, are, is quite predictable. It's got a very geometric defined form and things that are inside that cone of vision are visible and things that aren't, aren't. And if you block it, if you put something in front of it, you hide stuff. So here is a Renaissance uh, cabinet of curiosities, in which everything is really nicely visible. Uh, the stuff is displayed in a single layer, is one one item deep. And so nothing is obstructed. You can see everything there. Uh, there's a slight problem on the right hand side with the bookshelves because the books are stacked. So while you can see each one, there's still only one layer deep. And to get one up from the bottom, you have to move things around. So it's not quite as convenient as it should be. But this has been solved in a contemporary bookshelves because the books and the shelves have co-evolved to achieve this lovely uh, cooperation or collaboration between them where they're, they're thin and tall and they slide against each other with their nice shiny covers and so it's a very sophisticated uh, solution to making stuff visible and accessible at all times it took centuries to develop this actually and you sure don't see it in the fridge in the fridge, everything is cluttered, things hide each other there. It's hard to find things. Um, I would say that possibly the reason this is, is because the things that you keep in your cupboards in the fridge have not co-evolved with the kitchen. They've co-evolved with retail display to make them most effective as sales tools in that particular environment. So when you take just one of them out and carry it home, it's not designed for that. It's not designed to, to work well in the kitchen, and it doesn't. So here's yet another type of phantom volume. This is the phantom volume of accessories. Uh, there's the coffee maker, there's the compost bin, and there's the tin of coffee. So the, the compost bin was there before, but the tin of coffee arrived in the kitchen only after the coffee maker did. And it always arrives with the coffee maker. So it, it's not there when you don't have the coffee maker, and it is there when you do have the coffee maker, but the coffee maker has no admission 
anywhere in it's designed that there is this thing that goes with it. It's just kind of like, I'm the coffee maker and the, the coffee can is your problem. You just take care of it. Here's another one. Uh, toilet paper. So you've got one nice roll on the log holder and then there's all the ones that don't yet fit. So you've got to figure out where to store those. There's phantom volume there that was not incorporated into the dispenser, which could have been, but you just buy it every day, of course. But anyway, clutter, because this is now cluttering up the space that uh, there was no planning for. Here's uh, my lovely basement, and there's a nice high-end German clothes dryer there. And the arrow is pointing at this very elegant hatch, which uh, about once a year you have to open up. I use a butter knife to pry it open. And inside is a series of intricate operations to access a uh, lint filter. You don't use this very often, once a year max. And there's three different people using the machine, so no one remembers how to do it. So every time we do it, we have to consult the manual. And yet the manual, so the manual has to be stored. It's clutter. It's because I nailed it to the wall so it wouldn't get lost because previous manuals all went missing. And uh, it, it messes up my tidy home. So this, again, is phantom volume, not planned. I think that um, quite a lot of contemporary design, we're starting to see a tacit recognition of phantom volume. Here, here's rolling suitcases. There's the uh, original two-wheel one that tips over at an angle as you pull it along, and there's the kind of newer four-wheeled scooty type one. And if you can cast your mind back to waiting in line at the airport and shuffling down the aisle in the airplane, you know that the four-wheel one is much nicer. It is not nearly so irritating. And I think that's because its phantom volume is smaller. So I'm thinking that this concept might possibly contribute a little bit to a bit more precise planning of everyday nuisances and inconvenience. And here's the definition of, I've come up with clutter. It's the physical effect created when the physical volume of one thing obstructs the phantom volume of something else. When you put your boots behind the door, won't open all the way, that's clutter. It's annoying. This is not a big problem. This is not climate change. It's a tiny problem, but it is real. And I think in a philosophical sense, it points to the broader problem with design in terms of not solving the whole problem, of looking at just a little part of the problem and making that better. So food processors are just fabulous for chopping onions, but they're a nightmare to clean up. And I think we see a lot of this, and climate change enters into this, where you're just designing part of the problem. So I think that uh, it's a concept that's worth entertaining. And I think in terms of design education, it might offer, you know, perhaps a nice student project or two. I haven't taught studio classes for some time. I've been doing lectures. But there you go. Have fun. Go with it. Bye.